Hey everybody, it's Party Lead, and today we're taking a look at the hotly anticipated Jagged Alliance 3. Thanks to the developers giving me an early access key, I was able to spend a fair bit of time with the game, and in this video, I'll be highlighting some absolutely essential things to keep in mind as you dive into play. With timestamps down below, and no more time to waste, let's begin. Picking Mercs The first order of business, and something you're going to be doing from time to time, is picking, hiring, and training the mercenaries that'll actually execute your mission. You'll want to have between 4 and 5 at the start of your campaign, and you'll want to pay close attention to their actual capabilities when hiring them first and foremost. Mercs come with different designations that determine if they can repair equipment, heal wounds, etc, etc, so make sure to grab a mechanic, grab a doctor, so on and so forth. But keep in mind that they are also available at different tiers, which partly determines how much they'll cost to recruit on a daily basis. At times, you want to be wary of interpersonal relationships too. Hiring Steroid and then pursuing MD, for example, will have MD ask for more money since he doesn't get along with Steroid. Little things like this bring life to the game, but also force you to consider your options with a surprise here and there from time to time. Either way, though the stats associated with any given mercenary are fairly self-explanatory, with tooltips giving further detail where needed, I just want to highlight some elements that might be less obvious or unique to Jagged Alliance that you might not be aware of going in for your first playthrough. Health is very self-explanatory, directly tied to HP, while agility determines the total action points a Merc will have, as well as how hard they are to detect when sneaking around. And it also determines how much they can move at the start of their combat turn without needing to spend any action points. Free movement isn't something you'll typically see in turn-based tactical battles, and as you can imagine, it can make a huge difference in a pinch in Jagged Alliance 3. Dexterity, meanwhile, impacts how likely a Merc is to pull off a stealth kill, and it impacts the bonus they get from spending extra action points to aim in combat, something we'll touch more on in a bit. Strength is important for anybody who's going to be doing a lot of throwing, and if you intend to designate a party pack mule, they'll need a high strength as it has a direct impact on their inventory size. Wisdom is great for spotting loot and herbs when out on the field, and it has a direct impact on the Merc's ability to improve their stats and skills something they can accomplish through training operations on the strategic layer and through performing actions in the tactical layer. Shoot guns to improve your marksmanship, for example. Wisdom is also used to actually scout adjacent sectors out on the strategic map, as we'll discuss in just a moment. Leadership is the flip side of wisdom in that it improves the rate at which a teacher trains other mercs or trains militia at a village. Leadership also ties into morale events and the likelihood of getting good ones. Leadership also ties into other bonuses that you might get through conversations or world map events, which will increase the loyalty of villages or increase the discounts that they might offer you for things like travel and so on and so forth. Marksmanship is, as alluded to earlier, a measure of accuracy when shooting, while mechanical is important for anybody who's going to pick locks, detect and disarm non-explosive traps, or hack pretty much anything. Mechanically gifted mercs are also best at repairing equipment in the strategic layer saving valuable time as you go from battle to battle. Explosives training helps reduce the chance of mishaps when using grenades and other explosives, and it also impacts the likelihood of spotting and disarming explosive traps specifically, like landmines. Finally, medical training is a measure of how well a merc can heal others. These are all important stats in their own way, but I'd say health, marksmanship, explosives, and medical are probably going to be your most vital in the early game. These will keep you alive, hitting your targets with guns and grenades, and speeding up the rate at which you heal after combat. I should also mention that, unlike some CRPGs, the game doesn't automatically assign the best merc for the job when you give an order to the group as a whole. You should get familiar with your best across various categories when giving orders like disabling mines for example, and make sure to select them specifically to have them perform the action. Don't just let the game send the closest merc for a particularly important task such as disarming mines. It can be disastrous. Stats aside, your mercs will level up over time, gaining experience and ranks. You can recruit higher level of mercs for higher costs to begin with, but either way, they'll still have room to grow. As they do so, they'll acquire additional perks. Perks are locked behind prerequisite stats though, so keep that in mind as you decide what to train for whom. At thresholds of 70, 80, and 90 for health, agility, dexterity, strength, and wisdom, you'll gain access to an additional set of perks, but each grouping also has a prerequisite number of perks 
from that category that you need to have before you can access some of the higher level thresholds. Perks do everything from increase HP to bolster accuracy from high ground, going so far as to increase the chance of causing panic in the enemy when they're hit, improving stealth kill capabilities, and much more besides. A particularly valuable perk early on especially is Distracting Shot, a powerful tool to disable enemy overwatch without triggering a reaction shot from them. Perks and stats aside, you want to consider equipment that the mercs come with. Since ammo can be somewhat difficult to come by, you want to make sure the ammo your mercs need are varied, not all using the same limited supply of bullets. Most mercs will come with pistols, but some will dual wield pistols, which translates to double the shots for the same use of action points when equipped accordingly. But you also want to keep an eye out for mercs that are coming in with AK-47s, shotguns, and rifles. These are invaluable in the early game when you're still trying to find some of these guns out in the wild. Now, with your mercs hired, it's time to dive in to the strategic map. This layer of the game has a lot of moving parts, but it's relatively self-explanatory, so I'll keep this section relatively short. One thing to always keep an eye on is your timeline. This will indicate things like when contracts are expiring, when your mercs will finish tasks you've assigned them, when they'll recover from being tired, and when they'll finish traveling, as well as when enemy assaults are expected to arrive at their targeted destination. That aside, the timeline also indicates the current time of day, which is something you'll want to keep an eye on if you're planning on undertaking a stealthy approach. Waiting for nightfall is a good place to start in such a case. Timeline aside, the strategic map gives you an opportunity to scope out the potential threats and ways in which you can overcome them. Outposts will spawn enemy groups that move to attack your closest holding, and you can either train militia at set holding to fend them off, or you can intercept them with one of your squads to fight them elsewhere. Note that if you're standing in the path of an enemy task force, you will engage them in combat if they arrive at the sector you're in before you manage to completely leave it. You cannot avoid this battle, so make sure to dodge them early on if that's your plan, or stand your ground and intercept them to hopefully cut them off before they actually cause you serious trouble. Either way, these enemy task forces will come through every so often until their associated outpost is shut down, but doing so can prove to be quite a challenge. Hover over the individual shields to see exactly where the outpost gets its strength from, and tackle those matters to weaken the garrison and give your mercs an easier time of it. Eliminating outposts is a good thing to focus on when you can, but you'll also want to quickly secure mines to generate income that lets you pay your mercs and keep them on contract. Don't move too quickly though, mercs need to rest from time to time, otherwise they'll be operating suboptimally, and though you can use bandages to heal damage during a tactical mission, Wounds will reduce maximum HP by 10 each, unless treated by a doctor on the strategic map. Spend some time to perform operations from optimal locations, and don't hesitate to split your party up here too when possible. Send a capable leader back to the local town to train the militia, have your wisest mercs do some scouting to gather intel and provide you with more information when working on the tactical layer in adjacent sectors, and take the time to train your mercs up too. Note that when you do the latter, you should choose what trait you're planning on training before actually choosing your teacher and your students, as it more clearly indicates who the better teacher might be and who needs the most help. And keep in mind that you don't necessarily have to dive into a tile the moment you arrive at it. Even if the game forces you into the sector, you can simply escape back to the map and hang tight until you've recovered or waited until nightfall or what have you. You can also do this partway through a mission as long as you're not currently in combat. Feel free to clear part of an area out, and then retreat to the strategic layer, recover, and then dive right back in, keeping in mind of course that time is money. It's worth noting that each sector will also have a stash you can use if you find yourself carrying too much stuff, or otherwise needing to be able to go back and pick more equipment up from closer than your nearest base. This isn't the biggest issue in the early game unless you have mercs with low strength who can't carry all that much, in which case space will start to run out real fast. Either way. As you travel from sector to sector, you'll explore stashes, engage with locals, acquire equipment, and get into gunfights. When it comes to the last one, let's discuss a crucial first step. Positioning for combat. Between battles, you'll be exploring sectors in real time, and that comes with some great advantages and risks alike. First and foremost, learn your hotkeys. It can make a world of difference in a pinch, since in real time, situations can change on a dime. Take for example, throwing a grenade at patrolling guards. If you wait to click the button, the cluster might disperse before you even get the click in. 
tap shift G and you're just that much faster. Selecting all your mercs with the tilde key and flipping into stealth mode when you're about to get spotted by pressing H is also a lot faster than having to click multiple times. Swapping stances quickly between standing, crouching, and proning can make a very big difference when you need to quickly close the gap to an enemy you're trying to attack stealthily, run from cover to cover, or when you're in a rush to duck and hide. Tapping Z and X again is a lot faster than clicking through the stances while also giving move orders. Another important hotkey is the O key that takes you up to this view, marking key points of interest if you gathered intel in an adjacent sector, pointing out hidden stashes, vantage points, and a general sense of where enemies are situated. It's also a great angle to give orders from while keeping an eye on enemy patrols, as you try to get into position especially. When getting into position, there are a couple things to keep in mind. For one, don't be afraid to split the party. In fact, at times, it's essential to do so to keep eyes on enemies while getting into position or to get into cover. You can do this in a couple of different ways. One involves simply selecting individuals and telling them where to go, and the other involves making individual squads so that you can quickly select a set of mercs. You can use Control tab to switch between squads and then hit the tilde key to select all the mercs in that squad. Again, much faster than shift-clicking multiple portraits. Different mercs will be armed with weapons that work best from different ranges, and that aside, flanking an enemy does a lot more damage, which is an advantage you can give yourself early in a battle by splitting your party up and coming at the enemy from multiple angles. Having the high ground is a great way to increase accuracy, so try and secure that where possible, and don't forget to secure cover for your troops too. Keep in mind that cover only applies if you've adopted the right posture. Cover will be marked with half and full shields to represent half and full cover, but that only applies if the shields are blue. If they're marked in red, it means you're not actually in cover, and you might need to crouch to secure the benefits. On top of that, using the Take Cover action will amplify the effects of cover for more desperate circumstances. One more important consideration when getting into position is the fact that you can establish Overwatch before the fighting actually starts. If you know you're about to engage in combat and you can get close enough to establish Overwatch where your enemies are currently standing or where you expect them to run off to when the fighting starts, you can get some early damage done right as the fighting begins. Get into position, set up Overwatch angles, and only then do whatever action it might be that triggers combat. And when it does come time to trigger combat, keep in mind that even if you issue an attack order to do so, things don't suddenly freeze when that order is issued. If you're throwing a grenade to kick things off, for example, Make sure to time the throw animation and the travel time of the grenade to enemy patrols so that you're actually hitting your targets and they're not walking away as your grenade arcs through the air at nobody in particular. And for when the fighting actually starts, let's discuss how to win a gunfight. There are a lot of little things that can completely make or break a combat scenario and at times your entire campaign if you're playing on harder difficulties with Iron Man mode on. I don't think I can overstate the importance of getting into position before the fighting starts. You want to seek out cover, you want to secure the high ground, you want to ensure you have line of sight and lines of fire on the enemy, and you want to set yourself up to flank the enemy and if at all possible, you want to establish overwatch on areas that the enemy is currently standing on with the hopes of opening fire when they run for cover in their first turn of combat. This last bit alone can turn the tide of battle before it even begins. When the fighting starts, try to start it on your own terms. Fire shots or toss a grenade to get some initial damage in. When you find yourself needing to move and shoot, consider keeping some action points aside to help you aim. Based on your merc's dexterity, they can get a sizable bonus to hit. Right-clicking multiple times will devote more and more action points to your aim, up to a cap, and though the game doesn't give the clearest indication of just how much it helps to invest those action points, that's by design. That aside, you want to make sure that this bar isn't flashing, as that seems to indicate that you're firing beyond your weapon's optimal range, and you'll want to take into consideration these bonuses and malices when you're picking a target. Your order of operations will sometimes help remove some of these malices. For example, firing on a target with a weapon that causes exposed will remove the effects of cover, allowing others to get a much better shot on target. Without hard numbers to work with, you're really encouraged to stack bonuses and remove malices as best as possible while doing the reverse for yourself. Ensure you're in cover, as it can make a huge difference, and make sure you're changing posture when needed to take advantage of said cover. In fact, 
try and crouch or prone to make yourself as small a target as possible when possible. Moving around when crouched or prone will be extremely slow though, limiting how many tiles you can actually move. So you do need to keep that in mind in terms of the action point cost of changing posture when it's not free if you later decide to change your position. On the topic of aiming again though, don't forget to use free aim. It allows you to fire without a target, which means you can hit vehicles, barrels, weak cover, or anything else that might explode and cause damage or fall apart and give your enemy less to take cover with. At times, free aim will also allow you to specifically target a tight grouping of enemies with something like a shotgun or otherwise control the spray of burst and full auto fire to a degree. When not using free aim, make sure you consider your options in this overlay. Full auto fire can cause suppression, significantly reducing your target's action points for their next turn. Burst fire could net you a kill, risking some missed shots, where a more accurate single shot might get the hit, but not the kill. The weapon on hand determines the options here. Dual wielding will allow you to pick the weapon you're shooting with, a double barrel shotgun will allow you to pop both rounds at once, so on and so forth. And on the other side, you'll have a selection of specific targets to hit, and while the torso is the easiest target to hit, there are significant benefits to targeting elsewhere. Headshots, for example, cause much more damage. Hitting the legs reduce the enemy's movement speeds, getting the arms reduces their accuracy, so on and so forth. But of course, be wary of the armor icon, as it means you'll cause reduced damage. But the armor pierced icon means you'll punch right through the enemy armor. A brick wall implies cover is blocking your shot at that specific location, and a blue person icon implies that you're likely to cause friendly fire. So pick your target not just based on the amount of damage you might cause, but also, you know, if it's armored or if it's likely to cause you trouble yourself. It's important to note that shots that miss can hit cover or an ally regardless of the icon being present or not. So be very careful about trying to fire over your friend's head or when they're standing in the general vicinity of your target. Friendly fire is devastating, and there's nothing like unleashing a full auto spray that mostly hits your allies. Getting a good hit or an impressive kill can bolster morale, while losing an ally or taking a lot of damage at once can reduce morale instead, which then in turn has an impact most notably to your party's action point count. Be careful when managing party morale. You also want to be careful with wasted shots. In the early game especially, ammo is at a premium. Earlier I mentioned you want to make sure your mercs are using different guns so they're not sharing the same pool of ammunition. Similarly, you don't want to waste what ammunition you have. Hovering over a weapon in the inventory screen will highlight which ammo is used by it, and you want to make sure it's properly distributed to facilitate reloading during combat. You also want to make sure that freshly collected weapons have been reloaded before you dive into battle with them. Wasting action points, reloading them at the start is not a good way to kick a fight off. Combat in Jagged Alliance 3 is punishing, and you don't want to start off on the wrong foot with an unloaded gun. Sometimes though, contrary to popular belief, it's not a bad idea to bring a knife to a gunfight. The Stealth Advantage This section expands on the getting into position part of this video in some ways, focusing on the nuance of stealthy operations. It's a good idea to gather intel on a location first, as discussed earlier, but that aside, don't hesitate to wait for nightfall before entering the tactical map. The time of day is indicated at the bottom of your strategic layer, and operating at night makes you harder to spot, though keep in mind, it also makes the enemy harder to spot and hit too, outside of point-blank range. Modifying your guns with flashlights is helpful if things go sideways, lighting your enemies up to make them easier to hit. That aside, suppressors are a great mod for weapons on a stealth mission too, but they're hard to come by in the early game, requiring special resources beyond parts to manufacture. Do not despair though, since fists and knives can often do the trick just fine. Enter stealth mode by pressing H with your merc selected. This is different from simply crouching, as it changes what abilities you have on hand. It will switch your stance to crouch, yes, but simply crouching is not the same thing. Use stealth mode to sneak around and find good vantage points, seeking out loot that might help you in the battle to come, but otherwise also hiding behind cover and tucking away in bushes to get closer to or past the enemy, and keeping an eye out for enemies standing on the high ground that can more easily spot you. An enemy doesn't have to be looking directly at you for them to sense you though. If you're creeping around close enough behind them, they'll start to detect your presence otherwise. So if you're going in for the kill, you have to be decisive, and keep an eye out for the growing red semicircle beneath your mercs, or the growing red bar under their portrait. If this fills up, they'll be spotted, 
and battle will begin. Mercs that were previously hidden will stay hidden until individually spotted, meaning they won't be targeted and can perhaps set up flanking maneuvers, but certain maps don't lend themselves to that kind of maneuvering. Not every mission is suited for stealth action, so don't try to fit a square peg into a round hole. When you do get a chance to pull off some stealthy action though, it's not a bad idea to get some of your mercs situated in various positions to see enemy positions and observe their patrol routes, while your stealthiest mercs go in to actually get the work done. All you need to do to kill a target is mark them for the kill, and then get close enough. You do also need to actually land the hit and cause enough damage. A stealth kill is never a guarantee, and failing to get the kill, either by missing or by not causing enough damage, will trigger combat. Balance damage output against the bonuses and malices to accuracy, and make the right call. Once queued up, just find the opportune moment to strike. Observe enemy patrols to make sure you won't get seen by somebody else while performing the kill, and to ensure your target's body won't get spotted down the line. The other option, of course, is to eliminate the one who do the spotting before they get there. Even if you can't eliminate the entire enemy presence before the fighting starts, reducing their numbers even slightly can make a world of difference. When you have the opportunity, do not forgo the stealth advantage, as the upper hand it gives you could be the difference between life and death. But there you have it folks, some essential tips to get you started with Jagged Alliance 3 that should hopefully keep your mercenaries alive and paid. If you found this video helpful, consider hitting the like button, and if you've got any questions or tips of your own, drop them in the comments down below. Don't forget to subscribe for more strategy and tactics gaming, and as always, a Massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.